Hi everyone and welcome to our Transfuser virtual catch-ups with our, our alumni. Uh, this week uh, we're delighted to have Bradley Smith from Miracle Tea Studios who is part of our 2016 cohort. Welcome Brad, all the way from Belgium by the way. Is it? Yeah. That's yeah. Right. At the moment. <laughs> yeah, at the moment. So I'm um, delighted uh, to be able to have you here for this chat. So basically, the way we're going to work this chat um, today is that I'm going to have a, a chat with Brad all about his transfuser experience and uh, what's happened with Miracle Tea Studio since then. Um, and then we're going to have a uh, swap over to Bartek, who's going to run through um, the game that um, um, Brad and his team um, created as part of the transfuser um their transfuser IP and have now um uh, have now launched and released. So we'll talk a bit more about that um as as the conversation goes on and uh, and, and we find out a little bit about their uh, transfuser journey. So thanks, Brad, for joining us. Um, first of all, I'd like to kind of find out you and your background pre-transfuser. Where did it all start off from? You know, what's your interest? What kind of got you involved in in making video games? Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Brad. I'm the co-founder and creative director at Miracle Tea. We're based in Suffolk and best known for a game called Roya. Um, I spend like most of my time just like trying to make uh, the game look as pretty as possible and feel good as possible. Um, I think when I was growing up, I always knew I w either wanted to like work in video games or to become a professional skateboarder so like it was either like one of those two i think um it just so happened that i like work ended up working in games i think though that they're pretty they have some sort of similarities you know they're both really fun and really difficult um and the idea of that is like really addictive i find the idea of something that is challenging really like worth pursuing um so in many ways like making games for me is like the best sort of game um but I think a big reason why I pursued it originally is like my my old man helped me get work experience from when I was around like in high school at a company called Media Molecule in Guildford. Um, and that was like through his mate. And so when I'd done that as a teenager, I think that gave me a clear goal um, and a sort of drive to for something to work towards. Um, and I quickly realized that the people that worked at Media Molecule were just kind of normal people from normal backgrounds and that um, I could pursue that if I wanted, if I just kind of like focused and like put the effort in. Because um, I think when you're young, you tend to like perhaps, you know, like you hear about people working in video games and you're like, oh, it seems like this cool thing. And like, how do you get there? And you perhaps put people on a pedestal, um, but being fortunate enough to have that experience at a young age kind of brought brought like kind of washed that idea away I guess mm -hmm. um so yeah that, that was pretty much it I guess and then later went to university and studied game design um yeah cool so where did where did you do your 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 studying and and um what what you know, kind of course did you do and what, what, what university you part of um so I studied game design at the University of Suffolk which is in okay. Ipswich um, and it's just like a really great course. It's like the lecturers are spot on. Like I still have like regular contact with them and like we used to like, they're like really laid back. We used to like go to the pub with them and stuff. It's like a real laugh. And um, they put like a lot of emphasis on um, like non-digital games and paper prototyping and like the real theory side mm -hmm. of game design, which I think is uh, a really cool thing. I think that's what I think I credit a lot of that course to our success, just like in the way that like Miracle T think, like the way we approach making games is a sort of direct um, product of that course, I think. Um, yeah, they like put so much emphasis on theory and not much on tools. And I think a lot of courses just, just teach tools to people rather than mm. just like solid theory. So I have a lot of like really fond memories of like university, like working ridiculously hard, like doing loads of game jams and um, I studied with with Tom and Gav and we did like a bunch of jams like throughout our three years at university. So, yeah, it was awesome. 
it sounds like like you know your you know kind of your initial entry into kind of the cool games world was something that you know I, I loved how you put it whenever you had gone and done your kind of work experience these people were just kind of regular normal people and you know yeah. it was something that's actually very attainable and I think that's something sometimes certainly kind of with an with transfuser some of our teams are like oh you know are we good enough to submit our application are we good enough to take part in this and that you know it's something that you know it, it, that that um that, you know we like I try to kind of confirm to people is like you know if you don't have a go if you don't submit your application if you don't try you know put yourself out there and recognize actually yeah it's just kind of everyday normal normal people who will take part in this and and you know but it's you know it's taking that kind of figuring figuring out where you fit in it and that yeah it's, it is attainable and it's something that that's that's something that can be done so so that you know I think that that's really really encouraging and also by you know that your university is you know was kind of people were very approachable there and really oh, kind of yeah. cheering cheering you on and you know wanting you to do the best and to excel and to be to be the best that you guys could possibly be so so obviously you met Tom and the rest of the gang tell us a little bit about you know pre-transfuser you've done some game jams you know where did kind of your idea to apply come from how did your team kind of get established how, what kind of what was the spark that kicked it kind of all off so me and Tom, like Tom was the year below me at university. And then when we graduated, we were freelancing on the same projects together. And we were working for a company called the Imaginati, which were tied to the Imaginarium Studios in London, which do like motion capture um, for like movies. And we were building like little, little game prototypes for them back then. Um, we made like a little game called Star Smashers, which is like on Steam, it's like a little space game and like a card game called Rule the Worlds. And I did some stuff on like Planet of the Apes, like the VR version of the game. But simultaneously, as we were freelancing for that company, we we were like on the side. Tom had built like a little prototype from university and I was sort of helping, helping him uh, like with the art and like getting it to like a really polished state. Um, so we were kind of tinkering with a little prototype on the side and then um, we, he watched the news and then heard about Transfuser. And then, so we were trying to like make our sort of a career happen with like, should we do our own thing or like work for the studio? And we actually got offered full-time jobs like right before Transfuser for that company, but then turned them down okay. uh, to pursue Transfuser, banking on the fact that we were going to get it. And fortunately, <laughs> fortunately enough, we did, but like at the time, we didn't we didn't know that. So yeah, we like turned those jobs down, which was pretty risky and like stressful and scary back then. But um, so yeah, I I basically met Tom through freelance, and then we tinkered with the game, and then Enrico come on, got involved as we went through the application process. Like I think Tom met him at a game jam called Brains Eden in Cambridge, um, and then. When we were working out of the Eastern Enterprise Hub, Enrico would like travel down. And Gav was in my year at university and I'd done Brain Eden with him before and like a bunch of game jams, like a global game jam with him. Um, okay. So I knew he was like good to work with and good programmer. So um, that's pretty much how. So that's that how happened. it. How it all how it all came about. That's really cool. I mean, it's like it's cool that you saw Transfuser announced on the news as well, which is awesome. I'd imagine that was probably the work of your local hub getting their their news locally out, which is fab. Yeah. And then just, you know, hearing about how, you know, kind of meeting on things like Games Jams, you know, it's something that we really encourage, you know, participants to get involved in and to, to hone their skills. But also, you know, it's like one of the things that we do talk about, about, you know, teams whenever they're coming together is that taking that risk. And, you know, that's a that's a that's a massive thing for, you know, a lot of a lot of people when they're they're toying with the kind of not toying but they're con seriously considering is probably a better way to put it you know should I go and pursue this um this this dream of having my own indie studio and you know you know creating this thing I mean you guys really did make take a big risk and take make a lot of sacrifice to, to get to get there and you know that's 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 something I hadn't realized that you guys had, had done so that's very cool to to do that I mean <laughs> I think, we, I think I think we had the mentality of like, oh, well, we're young, like we might as well take a risk now. Like, why we have all yeah. this energy, yeah. you know? And like, my parents also like uh, brought me up in a sort of hippie, bohemian, kind of unconventional upbringing. 
and they're like they're both like self-employed and run their own businesses so i think it's kind of like in my veins to sort of pursue that thing rather than the other thing um yeah so and but i think yeah so yeah, I guess yeah. That's what I've got to say. So you kind of had it, you had a you know kind of quite a bit of an understanding in terms of kind of what it takes to be you know whether it's self-employed and you have that entrepreneurial kind of if you want to coin a phrase around it you know um, and 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 pursue the kind of the journey of of setting up um, a startup. So, um, so tell us a little bit about you know Transfuser. You were 2016. You were the first cohort of um, of teams to take part. Tell us a little bit about um, how you found Transfuser and, and your experience during doing that um yeah it was all really cool like um it's it's i think back then um like our, our th- at the start of our company running like we was we were just kind of like winging it but um yeah i think it was pr- probably like the best thing that we've done for our career because i think me and tom were really good at making games but we didn't necessarily uh know how to run a business and I think like tr- transfuser like taught us all that and I think we we as a team were also like perhaps like not too like sure of ourselves you know like we we would look at I, a lot of our peers would like go off and work for big studios or do loads of game jams and like win all these competitions and I didn't think that necessarily happened for us to a degree so back then and then so I think we had a little bit of something to prove and I think that uh, pursuing it and just even getting in, I think, gave us a certain level of confidence, like, oh, we can actually do this and this is something that we can pursue. And I think just the psychological impact that uh, that gratification had was, I think, mm-hmm. huge for our team, just like on a personal and professional level, I think. Um, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the game that you developed. You know, um, obviously, we're going to go on um, and kind of do a run through of it in a very I suppose, refined kind of process and what it was. What kind of stage was was that up to? And and how did you, you know, you you guys manage things like scope and delivering the deliverables and understanding, you know, what you were you were going to kind of take uh, have ready by the end of of the of the program. So when we started tra- Transfuser, I think the Tom just had the core cool mechanics built for the game, and mm. it was it was skinned in like a very different way to how it looked now. Um, and I had done a game jam called Indie Speedrun and like built a kind of weird art style that you can actually find the original prototype online now. And it's like it it looks a little bit like Roy. It has a, a similar sort of art style. And I basically we basically combined his mechanics and that art style for the transfuser thing to kind of come up with with Roy and it kind of birthed from there. Um, like Tom is really good at like game mechanics and I think I'm quite good at like the more emotional like mood and like visual side of thing. And when we combine them, it comes up, we come up with something quite interesting. Mm. Um, so, but in terms of like scope, I think me and Tom, we'd done jams before so much that I think doing jams like teaches you to scope quite well and i think it's something they really drilled into us at university and then like applied to transfuser um because we tend to just cut our idea in half and then we cut it in half again because we sort of know that half of that is what you end up making um, <laughs> so that, like we we yeah just like we're just like oh let's under scope let's do the simplest thing and even then it's still like you still end up like adding stuff but um yeah i think our initial intention back then as well was like we wanted to reimagine match games as well because I think in the indie scene like people think like oh match games like they're not that cool so we try to I don't know make them cool and I think we were looking at games like Bejeweled and then we were looking at games like Monument Valley and then it's like oh why don't we just like combine the mechanics of of Bejeweled with like the emotional depth of something like Monument Valley and then like see what happens Mm. and that's kind of like that's kind of like what Roy is. It's sort of a mm. marriage, a marriage of like those two ideas. And I think, I think my personality is very much like the more Monument Valley side of the thing. And then Tom is more of like logical, like uh, bejeweled type. And it's very much like a reflection of like how we work. I think, um, yeah. That's yeah, it's cool. 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful game to look at, and it's you know, it's very. You do feel quite reflective and relaxed as you as you go through it, and the, and the, I suppose the sound in the background. I mean, the whole thing's very well kind of put together as well. So yeah, it's it's um, you achieve achieve that well. So so you guys were selected for funding, um, which was which was great. And you know, I was just saying before on the, on, on the call when we we're having a quick chat, it was just like you know, it, it, what you guys have achieved is is is. Is, 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 is pretty um, amazing in terms of you applied to Transfuser and you got selected for funding you went on and and, and took the game IP and you've actually published it which is yep. it's, it's it's been you know it's, that's that's amazing and it's, that, that's a real achievement from you know a graduate team so young you know getting uh, you know uh, that and and you know just riding out the storms and the waves and, and all that kind of stuff of, of creating your own your own business when you started Transfuser, you know, were were you got had you established a business or or where were you at to in that journey? We were just, I think, we were just making games and like trying to like fumble our way into like making a business, but we hadn't registered as a business. That all happened when we applied for Transfuser and we were working through the Eastern Enterprise Hub. You know, we had to register a bank account and like set up as a limited company. Like that all like kind of happened. Yeah. Uh, as a catalyst for transfuser which is which is really cool because i think yeah. it it like made us i think just more feel more serious like take it more seriously it's like oh this is an actual thing now it's not like we're just tinkering with a little game it's like oh we're actually going to do this um yeah so, so what, what was the time scales from participating on transfuser to actually launching um Ruya? what was the what was the kind of the time scales for that and and was it what you kind of anticipated or you know I think so. Talk a little bit about that. I think when we finished, when Transfuser finished, I think we were trying to get it out in a year, and then it mm -hmm. took about a year and a half. So it released like November second, twenty seventeen, which is I think about a year and a half when we mm -hmm. like yeah. from Transfuser, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so it took a little longer than we thought, and I'm, I think I'm glad it did because I think um, the game would like perhaps wouldn't have been as good or as polished. So. Um, but yeah, I think that was that's, mm. that was pretty much it. I think yeah, and when it came out, people really like resonated with it. It kind of far exceeded our expectations of like um, how well we thought it was we were going to do. I think also what motivated to finish in that time. I think the idea of us just competing in Transfuser and then like getting a grant um, is is there's sort of like a moral obligation to like oh we've got this money, you know, like we've got to finish this thing, you know? Mm. So I think, and there's people watching us and, you know, they've heard about it. So it's like, you, you, we kind of always set out to just finish the thing that we were going to, you know, that we've started. So. That's, that's cool. Well, what was the kind of like, was there like, those are kind of kind of tensions that you guys had to like you know like what 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 people don't see behind you know the closed doors how did you know, how did you guys obviously manage that because you know you have a certain amount of grant funding that you received which is probably not going to cover for example you know your whole you know year and a half that you had to develop so you know that's maybe one thing to consider and then you know maybe the, you know you, you talked about there saying you know there was an expectation to deliver something and that again would probably bring tensions or bring you know kind of oh gosh how are we going to do that did you did you guys go through stuff like that I mean or was it quite clean sailing I mean you're obviously a very laid back kind of guy anyway so <laughs> but you know how did you you know how, how did you manage the you know the challenges that come come about with, well, with, with launching with your own game and your company yeah i mean there were definitely i think challenges i think like we all had like financial strain back then and we i think just dealt with that like tom like works a full-time job and just does this on the side and then tinkers with it uh you know as and when he can and then i jump between freelance um and i think uh yeah like i think we had some like ups and downs i think but um i think we all like realize it's you know n not necessarily like the other person it's just like at the time it's just someone dealing with a thing perhaps and often it's not necessarily uh reflective of like the game um i mean i don't know we we try to be like super honest and open like when we communicate about like things that are going on i think that took us a little bit of time to like learn how to do just like learn how to like communicate with each other and like you know being open to like 
talking about finances like you know with clarity and like not being shy about asking questions and things i think mm. a lot of that like emerged just over time and being comfortable with each other so at, at, definitely at the beginning it was like things were like tricky to navigate but i think we figured mm. out we i think that just comes from like figuring out who each person is and like yeah, yeah um so yeah I think. yeah i think it's interesting you know because you guys come you know have come you came from a you know uh, an experience where you kind of knew each other you'd worked each, with each other on different projects but then doing something like transfuser and then going on and setting up your business then it, it is a it is a different relation i mean you're still you guys are still the same people and you've got the same friendships and everything there but then there's still different things that you can learn and you need to adapt Sure. To with each other, you know, when you go and the focus is on creating something that you can sustain and, and a business and a company that you can stay to sustain. And um, I think that's, you know, it's something that you kind of need to work out, you know, as, as a team. And um, so in terms of like team working, I can pick up a little bit on that. During Transfuser, you guys were based at your local hub. Did you, all, you said that you and Tom were based there and was the whole team there or did you have a couple of people remo working remotely or how, how did that, how, what was the structure of that like? Um, so we're all relatively close by, except in Rico. Mm -hmm. Rico was in Cambridge, but he would travel down, but we'd cover his travel uh, okay. with the like, the, the, the initial like five grand that you get. Mm -hmm. um, so we like covered his travel a little bit with that and then uh but yeah we were all based in the area and we'd meet at the hub and yeah. just work from there and it was really cool it was a little bit like doing a fourth year of university right. you know because our lecturers would turn up and we'd like pitch to them um okay. but yeah yeah cool and you're so you're all working kind of remotely now you're obviously kind of you know pursuing you know making a game corporately together, but you're also got different areas in terms of for generating income and things like that. So how do you manage, you know, that kind of um, kind of relationship given like in 2020 this year and, and what's facing um, the, 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 the potential cohort for, for this year in terms of remote working? Is there anything that you would kind of pointers you would give for communication or you know how creating your game and how how you ensure that, that things don't get missed off lists and all that kind of stuff how, how do you guys work work now in that with that remote working environment we use like uh like trello mm -hmm. to keep track of like tasks and then we have like a slack group with different servers you know some of them are just like a server that just has unity stuff and then some is just music that we find that we like and some is just like cool films and then other servers is just like you know alula so it's just like the current game we're working on and then roya so each we have like a bunch of different servers that you know like it's it's just kind of like a cool space to hang out so i think mm -hmm. that, that helps um i know keep people i guess engaged and like keep spirits high to a degree so i think yeah it's just kind of like a cool space to hang out um so we have we have that our own slack group and then we have like a, a discord server which is more like of a community thing where we like talk to our players and things um but yeah like i think managing remote work can be really tricky it's, it can be it can sort of be easy to you know slip up with communication sometimes but um yeah usually i think you can just you know like you reach out and have a call and catch up with people and it's usually all fine but yeah, like in a lot of ways, me, me and Tom just kind of like get on with stuff. There's a, mm. a lot, a lot that we kind of we, you know, we check in with one another, and then there's an element of like we kind of know what we have to do. Mm. We just kind of get on with it, and then chime in from time to time, and you know, like send each other music and whatnot. <laughs> like, I love. It. I want to. I want to join your Slack. <laughs> your Slack thing. Oh, you're <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's just this cool space that we just kind of I love that you know because I think like I'm I'm quite a kind of like okay what's the project what's the you know do I know what I've got to do you know am I you know and so I get really too uh so hyped up a little bit about you know what I've got to deliver and am I however I love how you you know you've created this space which is really fun to be in yeah. online you know that can be it can be really difficult to do that as well because I mean it's just it, you know it's it is what it is but if you you know creating this the space which is good to, to be engaged in and, and it's inspirational yeah. and it's creative as well that's i think that's a challenge that you know we all face in this this, this current environment that we are and how do we remain creative and, and share these ideas and, totally. and in the on, online space that's that sounds fab that's great i think it's also like 
uh, an extension of like the kind of games that we make. Like mm. how we run a business is almost like an extension of that. Like cool. every everything is sort of like on brand to some degree, you know. Yeah. So yeah, um, I, love that. I, I think it's. I think maybe it's a bad way of working, and maybe there's more efficient ways of working. But I think we're happy and we're comfortable and we're healthy, and, yeah. our, and our games are getting done. So I feel like it works for us. So. Um, you know, and it's relatively stress-free, so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that sounds fine to have. I think, oh, can I join your company? Oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you talked a little bit about your community um, and building your community up. Could we I just talk a little bit a, a little bit about that? I mean, in terms of your external community, like on Discord. I mean, yeah. I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, if our teams do decide to go on and create um, their game and take it further, how they build their community engage with that is is really important can you yeah. talk about any lessons that you guys have learned or techniques you've used or things that you've done obviously you know you've talked a little bit about how the essence of how your company works flows through you know the spaces that you use and the game that you're creating does that then i suppose take it flows out into your community out with that as well uh i think so yeah like i think uh so we we do like game jams and we uh tell people we're doing game jams and we like share our work and um i think that's one way you can engage with your community is just like sh being like super open and like this is how we make stuff like we show kind of a lot of our bare bones designs and like things that are like ugly and unfinished and it's like uh you know we have like a kind of dialogue of communication with our community we don't necessarily like hide everything to some degree mm. but mm. I think that's uh, quite a good way. Um, it's it's really difficult as well to continuously manage the community as you know mm -hmm. on top of like developing the game. So it's some it's something we we're still learning and like need mm -hmm. to get better with. But I think, yeah, I think I guess that's all I've got yeah. to say about that. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's but it's always one of these things which is it's you know you you have the game to develop, but then also it's like how do we engage with our community and that's additional time and it. It does create yeah. a time and, you, you know, you want to kind of get back to people if they've asked questions or shared ideas and it can take, it can suck a lot of time in terms of just, you know, keeping on top of that as well. So I think that's a, that, you know, it's a good point and kind of, I think, uh, you know, kind of drawing uh, kind of, I suppose, lines in terms of how you manage that and, and, and you know, cope with, you know, sometimes it can, you know, if there's a lot of people getting in contact with you and a lot of, a lot of people trying to engage with you that I'd imagine that would be quite a could could be quite stressful yeah <laughs> I mean as well as like all the different social media platforms I think mm. one thing we do is we try to have like a different sort of we don't like post the same thing like everywhere I mm. think we'll have like an Instagram page and sometimes it would just be like loads of plant pictures or like flowers and things and it's like mm. oh that's kind of cool or like just shots of our office space or whatever so mm. I think um yeah and then like Twitter we post more like you know it's more like developers and we'll retweet people's stuff and like engage with you guys and like mm. you know share share some screenshots but like mm. I think we have each different social media platform we have a, like our own voice on each yeah. one and I think yeah. that um that's kind of useful to like I don't know pull people in um, yeah. yeah I don't know I don't know I think yeah I think that's really key it's kind of like understanding who is at the end of this platform you know because I think you're right you know the, the people who engage with Instagram are quite different from people who are some yeah. of them share and, and overlap but yeah I know myself personally I'll, I'll use Instagram for for a different thing than I would use Twitter or Facebook or Discord for example you know so you know it's kind of understanding why isn't somebody kind of coming to this platform and what kind of information is going to be helpful for them that doing yeah. that so I think that's a I think that's a really key thing so. so you have your new game um that's that's on could you tell us a little bit about a little bit about that and plans for the future and what's what's next for you guys uh sure so we're making a new game called Alula which is uh, a stargazing gardening game about what it means to be alone in the universe. And um, you basically just like decorate a little island with plants. You have this little uh, player character that's kind of Roya-esque. And I feel like if you liked Roya, you would definitely like this game. Um, and you can customize her and like move plants around and like tend to your garden. Um, 
and we're gonna have it so that you can also like visit other people's gardens as well like slowly over time um so we were fortunate enough to get funding for that with the uk games fund yep. um and that was a really cool for a cool thing for us like for our team because i think after transfuser we were like oh what's the next thing that we can do like what's the next stage it's like and uk games fund like felt like that's the next step in the sort of in our careers and mm. uh, as a thing to pursue because we we did actually i think as soon as roya finished like we launched that we pitched a different game to uk games fund mm. and then it didn't get accepted and then we're like oh, okay we'll just try again next year and then not getting accepted to that we just ported roya to different platforms and like maintained it throughout that year and then tinkered with little prototypes and then just tried again next year and then we're fortunate enough to succeed with that um we're hoping to get alula done hopefully like by next year sometime so early next year but we'll see um yeah it's going really well it's fun to work on yeah, yeah. well we're very much looking forward to to that from from you guys it's great so um, yeah, I'm just conscious of time and it's been okay. fab speaking to you um, and just it's been just been great to hear about your culture um, and of, of what you're creating and how that is kind of just really transferred into kind of the games that you're making into how you function as a team and how you, you know connect with the community. That's been that's been really interesting to, to hear about that and, and just to see it kind of working in, you know, in real life. I think sometimes it, you know, we can talk a lot about, you get a lot of kind of management talk around about company culture and people try so hard to do it. But actually, I think having had this conversation with you, just kind of realised, made me realise how easy it, it can actually be. So um, so that's been uh, that's been fab to, to hear that as well. And just talk about your, your transfuser journey and, and where you where you are, where you all are um, now in terms of uh, kind of four years on. So before we leave, I've just got kind of one final question that I've been kind of asking everybody. Um, if you could share one piece of wisdom with our up and coming transfuser teams, uh, what would it be? Um, scope scope really small and execute something. It's better to do uh, one thing really well than 10 things poorly. Brilliant, excellent. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> scope, scope and scope and scope well. So that's great. Thanks very much, Brad. Well, what Thank we're gonna you. do is we're just gonna take a little bit of a break um, and Bartek's going to get the live stream set up and then you guys are going to um, do a, a, an online run through of Roya. So thanks so much for your time again. Thanks for everybody for tuning in and listening to our chat and enjoy uh, seeing uh, Roya and all its uh, technicolored uh, wonder and, and glory. So thanks for that, Brad. Take care. You, you too. <laughs> there we are. Hello and welcome again. We are back with some gameplay this time. Uh, I'm Bartek and I'm going to be playing through Ruya and I'll be chatting with uh, Bradley, who's across in Belgium, was it? Yeah, that's right, man. Yeah, yeah. Belgium, <laughs> quite far away from UK, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we are getting hit with some emotional uh, narrative straight away. Yep. So this is like the little intro sequence that kind of sets the game up. Hmm. And kind of explains like where you are in the game world. I see. So seems like this person became a super being. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, her antlers, they they grew. Totally. Oh, She's yeah. in kind of like a yeah, like a dream state. Mm, I see. I see. Uh, and. Uh, Ruya means dream in like Arabic. I see, so, I see. so I that was sort of like. What's the hypnotic what mode? What am I changing here? Oh, that's so that's like a, a thing called a binaural beat, which is like a certain sound frequency that is like supposed to like put you in a state of like deep relaxation. It's a similar thing to like ASMR, where it like sends tingles down the spine. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, but I think some people resonate with it more than others um but yeah like we have a little bit of binaural beats like embedded in the audio as well like just in the the kind of ambience of the of the game soundtrack as well i turned down the the audio a little bit because it was it, it was a, a bit loud on my side but oh yeah that's cool uh, it's man. because i'm on, on on headphones um yeah i must compliment yeah. the art it's very good it's very well stylized everything fits together so well 
Cheers, man. <laughs> Was there a lot of vector art? It looks very uh, good. It looks very neat. It, it's not vector art, but I used to do oh. like flat. I used to do flash games, so like uh, my background is like in building vector art, but all of this oh. is done in like yeah, all of this is just done in Photoshop with just you know like clean shapes, um, you know, and like See. gradients. So I think I'm in, I'm I'm informed by vector art as a style, but uh, it's all like uh, PNGs, you know. It's oh, not. I see. Like, yeah. That's that's quite impressive because it's very clean. So kudos on that. Cheers, so you man. mentioned the the Ruya is uh, inspired. The name comes from a Turkish name. Yeah. So um, it's like a common name for girls, and yeah, like means dream uh, in Arabic, and I think. Um, we kind of like that the, the way it looked well, typed out like with the font that we chose and mm -hmm. um it kind of fit really nicely it's like quite a nice short word to type you know like for seo and stuff you know it's like mm -hmm. a quick thing to google if you you know you want to look for the game it's a little difficult to say like, a lot of people have uh trouble pronouncing it pronouncing it so maybe it's not so good in that sense but i think uh i think it has a, a, a slight kind of distinguishing feature i think that mm -hmm resonates um and i like i like that it's the game is about a girl in a dream state and then it's also a common name for girls and i feel like that fits quite nicely mm -hmm. with like the, with the character you know um i see uh, so tell me about the gameplay what's what's happening on 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 my screen at the moment i'm dragging some some floating uh, friends of mine it seems <laughs> Yeah, they're like so they're like meant to be your kids. So the little statues are kind of just like visual representations for like her family, oh, and you're, you're basically like yeah, it's the mechanics are like connect four, basically. So you like place these pieces, uh, like these parts of Roya into these cells, and then when you match them, the idea is that they're meant to like beautify her antlers. And like her antlers in the intro sequence is sort of like a metaphor for like her depression oh, and like her sadness. So it's sort of like this idea that like, yeah, like through beautifying her like parts of herself by like giving parts of herself away, mm -hmm. she kind of much she kind of masks her sadness. Mm -hmm. um, so the goal is just to like match uh, the little little shape at like top left, and there's a lot of sort of like deep nuanced like intent that we try to like embed into the game and a lot of it isn't necessarily clear or obvious but i think it's perhaps the sort of thing that is felt rather than um you know inherently told to players yeah no um, straight away mm -hmm. what i really liked what just happened there is that she shook off of, of the flowers that i just generated yeah. which kind of like almost resets her mood but back to the the press state, <laughs> yeah, we yeah. to call that. but it's a, it's a nice sort of way of showing that, you know, here we go again, another level, back to, back to that state, totally. you know. Yeah, because our intention, I think, with making this is like, we wanted to make a game that is sort of about, like, parents that put everything into their kids, you know, and I think it's, so it's like very much a game about, like, single mothers, we think, mm. and I think that's something like personal to us as a team and it deals with like it's quite a, a sort of the sort of subject matter that not necessarily a lot of developers perhaps explore um but i think on the surface as well it just looks like a cute little puzzle game but uh, there's some of the intentions behind it are quite intense i think mm -hmm. no, <laughs> certainly i mean after you explained to me how the the name came to be uh, I knew there is gonna be some more depth <laughs> mm. uh, <laughs> that's cool so also I'm quite surprised by the mechanics that you have actually implemented into this game because after after seeing you know the classic drag this connect these three you know it made me think oh is it gonna be a candy crush in space with an antler lady, you know, <laughs> but it's it's actually not at all. the The mechanics are completely different. Um, yeah, that's that's the, the handiwork of Tom on the mechanics. So, kudos to Tom. Good job. Man. Oh yeah, job. yeah. Um, he's a he's a beast, Tom. <laughs> Tom is a beast. <laughs> 
can I do this? I cannot. So it seems I have to actually follow the patterns that the game... Yeah. I have to match them to send... Uh, That's right, yeah. ...things through. <laughs> So when did you release this game? This game is on Steam, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's on Steam, it's on Itch, it's on the iOS App Store, um, it's on Armor Games and Newgrounds and Congregate. It's like everywhere we put it it's loads. Everywhere. It's places. on the internet. You Google it, you can get it anywhere. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's on Steam and Itch. Um, we recently uh, made it like pay what you want on Itch. So, you know, if people mm -hmm. just want to, like, pick this up for free, they can just download it and mm -hmm. check it out. Um, Certainly. So, if people just look up uh, Ruya on Ichio, you can, you can find the game, try it yourself, and maybe contribute to Miracle Tea Studios growth. Where did the name for the studio come from? Did you just have some tea one day and you were like, oh, this is it. <laughs> this is going to be the one. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, we drink a lot of tea, like you know, so, uh, <laughs> like so green tea in particular. <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, to I think Tom come up with that one. Yeah. So I can't, I can't, I can't remember the, the. I think he's he's got some cute story behind it, but mm, I yeah, I off the top of my head, I can't, I can't remember. But I think it sounds cool. I wasn't too keen on it at first, but I think over time it's sort of like it's grown me. Like I dig it. I feel like it fits. <laughs> so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think with with team names, you either get that one thing that's very, that just happens, there, there might be some situation that happens within your team and it becomes like a symbol for you, or you pick something and it just sort of ends up growing on you, you know? And yeah, yeah, I, I think in that sense, like, the latter was definitely true, like, it definitely grew with this, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the name of it informed the sort of brand that's emerged as well over time, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. I threw one of the heads, not in the place where I wanted it. <laughs> the, the particle system and the, the way the mouse is done it is very nice. It's, it's a very soothing game. If I, if I was... Um, <laughs> I think this is the kind of game I would uh, move on to from playing something highly competitive and getting yeah, really yeah. low-key annoyed with <laughs> how the game is going. <laughs> I would certainly launch this and just uh, play some Ruya to relax, you know? That's cool, man. Yeah, like we, I think we always try to make kind of just a chill space to visit, like a nice place to visit. It. And like we, you know, we use a lot of blues um, as a color scheme because like blue lowers your blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think like that's kind of like important to us just to have like a chill space. Um, I think that's kind of like reflective with the kind of based on the kind of people that we are. Um, but yeah, I feel like it's the sort of thing people like to do before bed or you know when they're just like hanging out they just like play a quick game you know mm -hmm. to de-stress um it's really difficult to like if the game is frustrating in any way that can be like stressful so it's really difficult to make a, a game that is relaxing because if there's anything that yeah. <laughs> is frustrating about it it quickly becomes not relaxing so <laughs> yeah, i think especially with puzzles uh, you have to create a yeah. puzzle which is like it needs to be a puzzle, you know, so you can't just be able to solve it straight away, but at the same time, it cannot be uh, something like cryptography for someone who has never done it, you know, where they have to do research on Google on how to do the thing before they actually get to enjoy the game. So, uh, sure. yeah, certainly finding that balance is... Yeah, I think also, like, a lot of people say that it's, like, quite easy and I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing. I think that that has an element of like accessibility to it. Mm. It gets progressively more difficult over time, but I think if you're a hardcore gamer, you're gonna find Roya like pretty easy. I think. Um, one thing I like that we did as well is like with the tutorial, we don't we just kind of like show people. We don't necessarily tell them what to do, like throw up a big message like, "Oh, do this, then do that." That yeah, like, actually yeah, I noticed that. <laughs> And yeah, but that, you can see, that took a lot of work. Yeah, you can see the steps. Uh, the, the, you can see the steps progress, sort of from this very simple level. Like the first three levels, I think they have yeah. clear, clear uh, 
steps in terms of skill like there are certain things each level teaches you um, sure and it's slowly implemented to the player which is very nice ah yes i need to merge the pattern so i think this game must have been some inspiration for alula which is your uh, new game you're working on yeah yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, it's like Alula is a different game mechanically and aesthetically to to some degree. Like it's a, I'm experiment experimenting more with like texture in Alula, like mm -hmm. from an art style point of view. Um, but there's but there's a lot of like similarities, and you know, like if you like Roy, you'll most definitely like Alula, mm -hmm. based on the kind of game it is. It's definitely on brand. It's definitely uh, a miracle tea game, and I think. Um, you know, one thing that we're trying to do I, that's kind of interesting is that we're trying to like set all of our games in the same universe and that kind of to create like a kind of consistent visual style and language. So in the same way that like Pixar set all their movies mm -hmm. in the same universe, yeah. like that's something we're kind of exploring do, to do, like to pursue. And I think, you know, like we want to build like a catalog of work that is sort of recognizable and you know, has a sort of style and a feel to it, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's very good, especially for a, for a new, new studio to be able to find that uh, sort of the base ground, the, the sort of, um, yeah, sort of base inspiration um, and concept for like, upcoming games as well. It's like, yeah, man, yeah. yeah, Alula is certain, not Alula, but uh, Ruyu, Ruya, how, how do yeah. I say it again? Uh, Ruya. Ruya, okay, Ruya, yeah. I think definitely became the uh, yeah. sort of the, the, the catalyst for, for Alula to... Yeah, yeah, and I think it comes from a very similar place and it deals with, uh, like, subject matter isn't the same, but it's like similar to some degree, you know, it's mm -hmm. dealing with some heavy subject matter but then rides this sort of like interesting line between like being mechanically interesting or what we think is mechanically interesting mm -hmm. and new and then um has a sort of like a bit of heart and soul behind it as well mm -hmm. and i think that like that's one thing tom's really good at is like mechanics and like um you know making something like feel good and like fun and engaging and then i think i strive at like the emotional side of things and like creating a strong mood and I think um, there's a sort of like push and a pull between me and Tom and I think it often ends up something interesting gets made. Mm -hmm. um, I mean when you think about it uh, in essence the game has to f feel good both in terms of gameplay and sort of narrative. If you have the... Yes. if there is like the practical connection if you call it that you press a button something happens and you like the way it feels that's like that sort of practical connection with the the game as a software itself but you also want that uh, emotional connection with the story sometimes you know um, yeah to totally i think like game designers are just emotion designers like when you strip it all away like all we do is just create emotions you know you just mm -hmm. create like interaction on the screen and then it makes someone feel a certain emotion mm -hmm. like it makes someone feel like, uh, you know, you have a certain type of interaction that might make someone laugh or might make someone feel tense or like feel disgust. And I think like the art of what a good game designer is, is like knowing how to like balance those kind of components and choosing which emotions to put together to like make player feel like this kind of roller coaster ride of an experience. And that's ultimately what a good game is I think is just a roller coaster ride of different emotions mm -hmm. and I think with Roy with Roya the kind of emotions that we elicit is like there's a lot of like awe and wonder in there so just the snow falling creates like a sense of awe and wonder mm -hmm. and then and then there's there's an element of cute you know like just the fact that she has rosy cheeks makes makes people go oh that's really cute you know <laughs> and that that creates that emotional response. I actually kind of think I kind of think she's cold, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. But yeah, like I think, <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm just being and compassionate. Then, yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, she's probably a bit nippy, I think. Sleepy too, super uh, sleepy. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, I very much agree. I actually, re- I'm really, I'm, I'm really liking what you're saying uh, as a player and as a game, the de- upcoming de- game designer, uh, I guess as well. Um, it's a very yeah. healthy way of uh, approaching uh, games. Yeah, because I think when we start out making a new game, there's an element of like, okay, what what emotions do we want people to feel? Like, what's the core emotion that we want? It's like, let's make a game that just makes a person feel like these three different emotions and just focus on focus on in on those mm-hmm. and like study and learn about what it takes and the psychology behind uh how people feel those emotions you know um because i think every little component in the game like is important as well like mm-hmm. every little detail kind of must in some way reflect like the overarching kind of message of what you're trying to say mm-hmm. so um if that's not like Dot, like researched and thought about, I think it kind of loses something. But yeah, I don't know. Making games is super hard, I think, as well. Uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, like you explained, there is the there is the gameplay aspects of every game, and there is the the narrative, which is extremely important. But yeah, I, I so find it very interesting what you just said. How you when you start making a game, you actually ask yourself, what sort of emotion does the do you want the player to feel? Which I think, totally, man. which I think, I find so. It's so practical to actually implement into every project because um, you can expand on from that so much. Yeah. You know, if yeah. you want to f- have the player f- feel excitement, you're like, depending what team you have, you might be looking at uh, hack and slash games, racing games, and they pick from that, and you can sort of keep scoping down the. The area you want to explore for that project, and I think that's very good to find the the, the ground where you want to uh, work on that project. You know. Yeah, totally. And you know, like I think you can get really obscure with the t- the types of emotions. You know, like if you, you know, there's a bunch of like really weird emotions that humans feel, and I feel like just to make a game about an, a, a, an unusual one is, mm-hmm. is an interesting thing, you know. There is a lot of uh, visual UI aspects that this game uh, makes seem very minimalist and sort, yeah. of, sort of like the moves or like the pattern I have to make or something I just noticed after my last level which is there is actually the concept of rating how well you did on each level with the flowers. Yep. I just yep. noticed that after like my fifth level because oh. how how it's uh, actually integrated into the, the whole visual. So yep. I yep. think it's, every every single thing complements one another. It's yeah, it's it's really difficult cheers man, I appreciate it. It's really difficult to like um balance the like the clarity of like minimal UI, you know. I think a lot of people don't uh, necessarily like pick up on that and I think that's one thing if I was to develop Royer again I think I would have made the clarity of those flower rankings a little bit clearer mm-hmm. um, but yeah like s- some people don't quite make the connection of like how they work um, and a lot of people also don't know the little the little thing on her head the kind of symbol kind of dream catcher type thing also tells you the next character the next the next color of the character that you're gonna get oh more I yeah. <laughs> so, yeah so but like a lot of people don't figure that out and i think oh, it's, i like the idea that like people kind of discover these things um I and it's not necessarily say, I, don't think, I don't think it's a bad thing to be honest and... yeah I, I, and i mean like it's not necessary you can still beat the levels and progress and like you know have your fun with, with the game without knowing that but it's, it's a sort of little thing. There's loads of little things in Royal that you can discover as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm a huge believer that uh, games should allow players to explore and not give them everything on the plate. And I think these oh, days, yeah. a lot of even the mainstream games, it sort of became a norm to take the player by their hand and be like, this is your oh, game, yeah. there you go, have a treasure, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and there is just, yeah. there is this like, there is an emotional pattern uh, where if you have to work hard to sort of find out about something, right? Or to yeah. maybe defeat a certain boss, the the reward from the game and the satisfaction you get is so much higher when you actually have to put in some effort. But sure. it's scary to make the player 
struggle a bit because they might be discouraged from playing the game, you know? So, yeah. uh, no, finding that balance is certainly uh, certainly challenging. Someone, I was I was laughing earlier, someone in chat, Kieran McIntosh said, uh, stream, making games is super hard, <laughs> and me, not sagely. <laughs> Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> That's why I looked at my phone. I was trying to see what what the chat was saying. <laughs> uh, beautiful game, I know, right? The game is the, the art is top notch. It's top notch. Oh, cheers, Joe. I love you, Joe. <laughs> That's my mate. That is. Yeah. Is it? Joe coming in with compliments. Thank you. I appreciate that, Joe. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't even mind how how s simple the game is, I could say. I'm just I'm having a great time. I'm <laughs> I'm doing great, and like the the way the, the the sounds are very soothing. So if I do if I connect the let's say I connect three of these, it's just it's nice. I feel like I accomplished something small, but it's enjoyable. Uh, I might not cool, might not change the world with this single move, but it's soothing. Yeah. Right? It's it's coming, which I, which I guess is what, what we aimed for, in a sense. <laughs> You're getting some love from the chat. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how is your, how is your team doing with working uh, remotely? How is that uh, working for you? We're doing all right. I think it's a little bit up and down, but I think that's just necessarily because of the state of the world. Mm -hmm. Um. In many ways, nothing has really changed for us. Like we all, you know, before the the whole the global crisis, I think mm -hmm. we were we were already like working remote. Um, so yeah, like we, I think I think it's something we're really good at. I think we our motivation definitely goes up when we meet in person, and um, but you know that's something we can't really help. But you know our motivation is equally goes up when we just you know communicate and have a dialogue over over the you know like telephone or whatnot so i think yeah um but i i try to you know like eat clean you know stare at plants a lot and like do yoga and like look after myself to like keep a level head and you know um yeah because i feel like it's important to sustain yourself over a long period of time because no, you know definitely. I think we want to keep making games for as long as possible mm -hmm. and so you know I feel like looking after yourself and your psychology is like super super important mm -hmm. uh, yeah Kieran uh, Macintosh in chat said it's amazing how much difference uh, how much a difference being in person makes yeah yeah I, I definitely agree I definitely agree uh, because essentially uh, during these uh, these strange times, I guess, like you said, your workflow is essentially the same, but not having these meetings with your team in person is kind of makes the difference. I guess you thought uh, maybe not that you thought, but you never expected to make such a big difference because you I don't know. I, th I feel like we take it for granted to be able to meet someone. And when it's not there, it feels it feels weird. You know, it feels strange. For sure, and you know, just meeting someone in person, you can kind of get a better sense of like what they actually mean when they mm -hmm. say stuff. Like, because certain things, like their body language or little Absolutely. visual cues, mm -hmm. you know, you can like, you know, you can tell like if a teammate is like struggling with a certain thing or like isn't is confused or whatnot. And I think, yeah, like meeting that, meeting someone in person, like, just is a better way of communicating. But you know, I think we're managing fine. Um, I think if you if you if you are ever feeling down, just play some Ruya together. And you'll be fine. <laughs> just have a chit chat. Just play some Ruya in the background, and you'll be doing absolutely fine. Oh my God! And Frederick said in chat, the game is really beautiful, and also the design talk is really refreshing and interesting. Ah, thank you. Ah, cool, man. It's a cool. friend of mine from my course. It's very nice to ah. see you in the in the stream. So yeah, just for anyone who's tuning in, I'm talking to Bradley, who's actually the uh, were you the creator of the Miracle T? Uh, uh, so I'm like the co-founder, creative co director. So creative yeah. director so, of the Miracle T. So I do like all the art and the, the visuals, and then me and Tom 
Uh, Tom does like the development and the code, and then we kind of both collaborate on the design. And then we have Enrico that does all the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a bunch of uh, contractors, like our mate Gav, who's helped us with programming. Mm -hmm. And we have a friend called Laurie, who's helping us with our new game. That uh, he's helping us with some programming and some like online server stuff. I see. Um, and yeah, the, all of those people we kind of met through the indie scene and like through game jams and things. Mm -hmm. And they're all sweet at us. Do game jams, <laughs> you can meet your future uh, co workers. <laughs> <laughs> also, yeah, if you want to have a. If you want to try the game out, it's avail available on uh, itchy.io. If you just look up uh, Ruya, it will be it will be there. And yeah, you can we made, it, go. made it made it pay what you want, and so you can just check it out. It's pretty cool. Yeah, well, it's great. It's very relaxing. We are we got about I think we can go on for at least 10, 15 more minutes. Um, just oh, having a yeah. check at the at the time. Will there be a Ruya too? Or maybe <laughs> <laughs> there's been there's been talk of it. Like um, we'll see. We we thought about doing some like downloadable content or like a little map pack at some point, but uh, we'll see. I think I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I'm just seeing a lot of potential in 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 <laughs> custom skins for these uh, so, <laughs> sort of heads and stuff. I think that area could be explored. <laughs> For sure. I, I also, like, with this, I really wanted to, like, um, have her age over time. Oh, like, that's very interesting, yeah. Yeah, like, I wanted to, her, like, by the end, like, she turns into, like, an old lady. and She's, like, really wise-looking and, like, has, like, white hair, you know? I like um, how you mentioned wise-looking. I was just recently, uh, I was playing an MMO and I was talking to my girlfriend about how usually... I think it was it was it was an yeah. I think usually in games where you have an old person, like yeah. ninety percent of the time they are the wisest NPC you can meet <laughs> in that game. You know. <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh. What was the inspiration for the audio here? What were you trying to achieve with the audio? Uh, I think just creating a calming space. Um, so. Each world has its own theme, and I think Enrico would just see some of my art that I would mock up, and then he would just kind of vibe based on that and just, I think, try to imagine what that would sound like. And I think for a while we had a lot of different sound effects that were really jarring and that would be distracting, mm -hmm. um, and we had to really like be careful you know to like iron those out we didn't want some sound effect to feel like it didn't fit within the world or because i think that that can be a real like immersion killer you know um uh so yeah that's pretty much it we have like uh like enrico as i think we've got like the soundtrack on Bandcamp, so like people can like check out the audio there and yeah like the soundtrack's like really cool i think he's done like a fantastic job um, and I think the, the 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 I think he got his girlfriend to do the voice for Roya, mm. and then which was kind of sweet. Um, Very wholesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I brought up the soundtrack because it it changed uh, quite drastically in terms of tempo from the first level to this one. I think yeah, it's much I mean more. It's much more vibrant uh, in this one that I'm playing right now. Totally, like it mixes up. So like there's eight worlds in Roya and there's 64 levels in total. Um, and then each world has its own unique ambience and its its own unique soundtrack um, and its own like kind of vibe and mood. And I think the just the, our thinking with that is like we want to have like have it so that she's kind of on this little journey of like different dreamscapes and she's visiting these different worlds and these different spaces you know and each one should feel like a little bit different and has its, have its own vibe going on mm -hmm. she should just keep the flowers she shakes them off <laughs> <laughs> i if you, provide if you lose... ruya with some help and she shakes them <laughs> off come on <laughs> also as you progress little mushrooms grow at the bottom of the screen oh i actually just noticed the mushroom but i thought it was there yeah 
Uh, you can interact with them as well. Ooh. Oh, I can. There's so many yeah. things to this game that I <laughs> notice only if I'm pointed to it, because it's very... It's like a one thing, you know? <laughs> really kudos to the visual sort of design. Um, throughout everything, from the from the UI to, to you know the elements of the environment. It's nicely done. Well, yeah, like we, we strive for like diegetic UIs to like UI that's embedded in the world, you know? Because I think even like before like a really early version of this game is like, like when you would lose it just like a little ui panel would come up saying like oh game over you know you lost try it in the level again mm -hmm. and then it slowly got refined and iterated down to just having roya like cry so like if you lose a level she just like goes back down to the bottom and cries oh, and it like i, I cannot it, lose can't can't i don't want to see that <laughs> <laughs> and like it like communicates the thing, you know, and in a really simple way. And I'm like Absolutely. a big like kind of believer in that of like stripping things down and, and even just having no text and communicating that with an animation saves this like money on like localization because to be able to translate game over text mm -hmm. in like all the languages is like so much more work and so much more um, money. It just like makes sense to try and think of like interesting ways to like make UI diegetic. That's smart, that's um, smart. I'm taking uh, mind notes on that. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, man. Like that, that's one thing I'm a big believer in is just communicating everything visually and like mm. trying to have as little text as possible. And then and then it's sort of universal, you know, like anyone from any part of the world can play this thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you, also if you touch her, she like animates. Oh, I'm, when she's I'm, meditating. Okay, when she's I, meditating. I, need to, I need to get her to meditate again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she like, if you touch her, she like blushes and sometimes like her hair flops down and she does like a little giggle and stuff. It's like really super cute. Um, there, was a, there was a joke I've seen on Twitter about um, someone asking about the... If the Animal Crossing has a boss or what is it about? Does Ruya have any boss in the game? <laughs> Oh no, unfortunately not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't think I've ever designed a boss, a boss battle. I'd love really? to though. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Ruya too. She, she stops meditating. She's out to <laughs> hunt monsters. <laughs> uh. Yeah, hack and slash Ruya. That'd be cool. <laughs> hack and slash Ruya. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just just kidding around. <laughs> yeah, that's cool, man. <laughs> I think that'd be cool. There's a sun in that. We recently, uh, we did a Ludum Dare recently, a game jam, which is like pretty fun. We made like a little game about keeping a planet alive, which Ooh, is a laugh. I see. Yeah. Uh, quite applicable to our planet. <laughs> yeah, totally, man. <laughs> Is this the, is Ruya the sort of, uh, if you could call it a genre, is this the sort of games you always wanted to make or was there something else, for example, when you, when you started learning about game design itself, was there like this dream game you had that you always wanted to make? Um, I think, not really, I think I tend, for me, I tend to just, I've made a bunch of different little games. I don't think I have uh, any one big grand idea in my head of the thing that I want to make. Mm -hmm. And I tend to I tend to make games about the parts of myself that I perhaps don't understand or emotions or a feeling or feelings that I have that uh, I are perhaps weird or like vo there's certain vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. And then I try to create a game about those things to better learn about myself. Mm -hmm. So I sort of use games as a, as a form of self therapy, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it sounds really like pretentious and like weird, but I think I don't know. It it, it honestly helps, and I feel like I've, making personal games has made me like understand myself more. And I think dev more developers should do that because I feel like you can learn so much about yourself from pursuing personal work. Mm -hmm. um, and mu music is a really big inspiration for like when I'm generating ideas. Like often I will just sit and listen to music, 
and I would imagine what a song would look like in the form of a game, and then just kind of roll from there. Like Alula come from like a uh, like a folk song, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, like I just would just imagine what the space would look like and the emotions that it makes me feel. I'll just be like, ah, oh, I just want to create that in I the see. form of a game. Mm-hmm. Um, very expressive. Yeah, like, very expressive. Yeah, super artsy, right? Like, <laughs> I don't think Tom can handle it, but <laughs> so he kind of. Th- I think he, he balances that that part of me. I think, which in a really good way, because I think if this was if I if I was just making games on my own, I think they'd be like really weird and like I don't think I'd be able to do it, you know, financially for a living. And I think Tom really, and I, I don't think they'd necessarily be fun either. I think they'd perhaps look pretty but they might not be fun. And I think Tom really like uh, makes me think about things at, on a different level that I wouldn't normally think about. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, having that, that person who, or not having that person, rather looking into the, the mechanics and the gameplay feel itself, apart from the narrative meaning is, I think is very important. Um, that's something yeah. I tend to focus oftentimes, um, which is very interesting because I, I recently myself actually started, um, I went back to some games that I played uh, during my childhood, um, some racing games, and um, I realized that I played racing games for not just for the racing, but for the narrative, some of them, which oh, that's great. to me was very interesting because I actually, when I design games, I focus on the on the mechanics and the gameplay feel like when you when I press a button I get that sense of satisfaction you know but sure. I feel like I like games for the narrative which I think is very interesting so having that person in the team who can balance it out is definitely very important like you said yeah and I think often um I don't necessarily think I'm a good like narrative designer in any sense I think I just make stuff that's personal mm-hmm. that's like about real people that I know or things that I've observed. You know, there's a lot of like things in Roya that I've observed from like my family. So like the character actually kind of looks like my mother and my sisters. Oh, I see. And some of and some of the little dream sequences that you unlock are like from real situations that I've observed, like family family situations. And I think that I I think when you dig deep into yourself, you can often find something that is like perhaps different Mm -hmm. which i think is a really which is often i think a kind of a cool way of like coming up with something that's unique because i think ultimately everyone in the world is different Mm -hmm. and unique everyone has like their little weird thing within them that they that makes them tick Mm -hmm. and i think if you express that part of yourself and you're you know uh courageous enough to show the vulnerable parts of yourself you often end up with something that's quite different and when people resonate with that, uh, it's a really, it's a super, really, it's like a really good feeling, you know, because it, it makes you feel like a little bit less alone, you know, because this thing you, you that you thought that you just felt mm-hmm. or experienced, other people like feel too, you know, because I think with with the kind of games that I make, I definitely try to, I think there's an element of me like trying to communicate with people about like what I think is perhaps interesting or like a unique way that I see the world, I'm trying to like throw, put into my work mm-hmm. to find to find other people like that, basically. I see. But yeah, I don't know. It's, it's almost like a way of communicating with the world from you to like the... Totally, yeah. Like I using think, using like, the product of your passion to sort of communicate, it's quite interesting. Totally, yeah. And I think, um, you know, like I, I run a game jam called like Hardcore Punk Game Jam. So I have like an interest in a certain type of music that is like, really niche and like no one really likes it and it's like a bit weird <laughs> but but like what's cool is like you just do a game jam about the weird thing that you're into and then like people start turning up and they're like oh i'm into this weird kind of music too and then it's like ah oh, as a little community grows and i think yeah that's like a really cool thing i think that's like the beauty of the internet i guess and i think there's an element of uh the games that we make is is tied to that too i think Certain people resonate with our work more than others, mm-hmm. and I think those those certain people are kind of have a similar mindset or view of the world to us, and I think that's like really cool. I see. Um, something that I uh, kind of want to touch on about what you said 
is I think the fact that the what the I've, what the uh, sort of personal approach to any project does, I think, is it yeah. allows you to be much more passionate about what you are making. Because, you know, oh, yeah, it's man. personal. There is no way you're going to make it bad. It's like, it is personal, you know, it has to be, yeah. it has to be good and you care for it and you want to make it uh, the best you can, you know. For uh, sure. Like, and when people resonate with it, like, when people really like it, it means so much more, I think. <laughs> no, definitely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, it's a really good feeling. Um, I, I had some very great question, and you know, it just it just flew away. Oh, that's good, I man. entered meditating state. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> we'll come back. Yeah, I'm sure. We'll, we'll come back to it. We'll come back. To it. If not, if not, just let it go. I think might not, have, might not be needed to say. You know. <laughs> Uh, ah, it was about the you. You mentioned that you hosted a game jam. Um, yeah. And I just think that if you sort of when you are true to what you like, it's much easier to actually connect with people. I think even oh, if totally. the things like, you like are uh, not yeah. that common. Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah, I think growing up, I think for the longest time, I'd always like feel like weird or different to people, mm -hmm. and then I think the moment I sort of just lent into who I was life got so much more interesting and it sort of relieved some a lot of like i don't know uh pressure and i think yeah i think that's like a really beautiful thing i think that just comes with like age and growing up anyway but yeah it's, it's really cool to just lean into who you are i think i agree absolutely um <clears throat> also like i'm really into like these like like hippie guru spiritual teachers which really help like with the development of like royal so like people like there's an english philosopher called alan watts that i'm like super into who just sort of like speaks about life and like um existence and it's like super interesting mm -hmm. um and I, I spend like pretty much the whole most of development for Roya um just listening to like people like that another guy called ram das who i'm really into mm -hmm. um and I think a lot of that, like, what well, when you're working on the game, if you're like consuming stuff that is like reflective of what you're trying to say, it's I think that can really like help you with like developing the game. I know like um, the people that like made Doom, they they decorate their whole office in like a certain way, and they like listen to like death metal when they're making it to really? like get in, yeah to get in that the mindset of like that's so interesting. And, and and like Media Molecule as well, like they decorate their whole office in in such such a like like I know when they were making Tearaway, they had like paper craft just everywhere, like all over their office, and they, mm. you know, they they decorate their space external from the game that they're making to be reflective of the game to kind of get them to trick them into the mindset of like the kind of world that they're making. Mm -hmm. um, and since working on a little like since working on a gardening game like. We've we've been getting like our team have been getting really into like just planting things and like growing growing um, food like Enrico grows his own veggies. Oh. Um, yeah, and it's and I think that's I think that's a really important thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm getting I'm getting quite immersed in in <laughs> Oh, that's good. That's it's, good. It's very enjoyable. <laughs> I'm getting. I think I'm getting better. <laughs> Did anyone ever attempt to speedrun your game? I don't think so, no. I'm not that I'm aware of. So we've had a lot the thing is I think it's the sort of game that a lot of people have played. Um and but I don't think a lot of people have ever really like we've had a few like let's plays and like streamers play it, but it's never had a huge streaming community and I think it's the kind of game that uh doesn't um perhaps like resonate with those it's, it's not designed in such a way to like perhaps appeal to those yeah, kind of people because it's, um... it's, it's very much like a mobile game and we you know like we it's done really well on like ios and i think it's done less so on pc it's doing it's doing better now on itch but i think so maybe like it might grow and have a little you know community of people that have tried to speed run it but yeah it's also quite a slow paced game as well mm -hmm. um but yeah that would be cool to see to be honest no, I definitely think, uh, as you said, the... 
I think I've game. done it in about an hour. Sorry? I think I've I think I've done it in about an hour or so. The full game? Yeah. Like speedrun it. Very like nice. when we were testing it. <laughs> no, I, I definitely agree that this game feels very it's much more it feel like you it, like you said, it's, it feels personal even just to play it. It's just the kind That's of game cool. you want to sit down, play on your own, relax. Uh, yeah, if I was cool. to play it on stream, if I was to play it on stream, it would be, like I said, after a streak of uh, unfortunate games in some competitive title, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, it's cool, though. It's cool. It's, it's, it's always weird, like, watching people play as well, because you can, like... I kind of like look at it and I'm like, oh, I could fix something there. You know, I could make oh, something a little bit clearer. You know, it's like, it's the cliche thing of like, art is never done. It's only ever abandoned. And when I look at people play my games, I just think, oh, I, <laughs> I could totally do more things. Um, especially like having realized like, uh, like reflecting on like what I've learned and looking back on it, it makes me realize like, oh yeah, I do things a little bit differently now, you know? Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's just like you said, everyone is different, so I think it's hard to tailor the game for all the users in the world, keeping in mind oh, yeah. what they can do. So I think when you see someone play and you have all these things sparking up that you could have, could have done this or that different, I think it's because um, everyone will play it different, you know? It's hard to <laughs> predict what, what sort of moves everyone will, will, will make, right? For sure, I think that was a mistake we made. Um, so when we started making this, right, like our lecturers taught us, like, yeah, you should like really listen to your players. And when a player says your game is too hard, that doesn't always mean that your game is like too hard. Um, and that you, you know, like, because if you make your game harder, you make your game harder for like that one person, and then there's a whole like bunch of other people that would then find exactly. it like. Too too easy and so that if you just keep listening to your players and iterating based on their feedback you're just infinitely going to be tweaking your difficulty to be harder or easier exactly um, that's the kind of based, thing yeah. <laughs> yeah like based on like each individual so i think there's an element of like as a designer you have to be like what's the sort of difficulty curve that we go, we want to go for like raw is quite an easy game and i think it has a little bit more of a like appeal to sort of a casual gamer right mm -hmm. um it's the sort of game we made for our mothers um, that people, you know, people that wouldn't necessarily play games. And I think um, that's okay. I think you definitely just have to, as a designer, just commit to a kind of difficulty and just, you know, this is a hardcore game that's really difficult or vice versa, you know? Yeah, yeah I, I certainly agree. When we were with, with UK Games Fund, we, our, the first uh, live streaming visit we made was to yeah. Ant Workshop. And uh, one of the, I believe it was Tony, he was saying that uh, with game development, th th there is this sort of line that you have to be aware of, of where the, is the user just being silly about the feedback they're giving you? Or are they actually yeah. pointing out something that has to be fixed, you know? Sure. I know, and often people say something and then, but their like facial expression or body will be completely different. Mm -hmm. So like when I watch people play like my games I tend to just like it sounds weird but like just quietly watch from a distance and observe <laughs> them like without them knowing because then that way you get kind of a true representation of like how your game plays you know you can tell like if they frown in a certain way that they might be confused you know just by the micro expressions or if they just get up straight away after sitting down then you I may mean, be like that's, oh. a, that's a very clear <laughs> sign that someone did not really like the game <laughs> Totally. I mean, that ha that's happened a lot, to be honest. Like, just getting someone to sit down and play for 10 minutes is, like, really difficult. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, but you can learn a lot from just, like, observing people, you know. Mm, I see. I think I reached the boss of the game. The background <laughs> changed. It made me think of, like, a boss room. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool, man. Yeah, I think we'll be finishing up soon in about like five minutes. I think after this level, we'll finish up. Um, no worries, man. But yeah, I had a great time playing this, not gonna lie. Very relaxing. <laughs> oh, cheers, man. Also, about, it. so, about what you said about like uh, watching the player play, um, something that I uh, discovered from 
uh, watching like um, my streams to check the audio etc is mm -hmm. that when I play when I focus within a game like when I really try to focus to do my best in some competitive game I just have a I have an angry face expression right <laughs> yeah I just look angry for some reason I don't feel angry whatsoever I'm very focused on the game but on sure. the outside I actually look looks... like I'm angry with something you know <laughs> <laughs> yeah which is it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I think like, I guess as you're in flow, right? Like people will probably, I think everyone has different sort of faces when they, yeah, when they're concentrating, you know, like some people stick their tongues out or, uh, you know, like make weird noises as well when they're concentrating. <laughs> so, yeah, like I know someone that like makes a little pop noise, like when they're oh. concentrating. <laughs> and it, yeah, it's a super, super key. <laughs> Yeah, there is many of those. When I was younger, I used to stick my tongue out uh, in the racing games most of the time. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder what that's about. I might have to look into that a little bit. That's yeah, interesting. I wonder how, like, biologically, what's the, what's the connection with sticking your tongue out and trying to focus? So... <laughs> yeah, uh, there's some psychology going on there. I wonder what that's about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have four more of reds to complete and four more of purple. Are the expressions on the guys at the bottom always different or do they change depending on if they are full of the... Uh, I think... I think some... So they have like a sleepy state and then like an active state and then I think if you touch them, I think some of them have different expressions for when you touch them. Oh, they um, do. Yeah. But I think it's, it's using like two or three sprites, I think there's only a few little states. Yeah. I, yeah, there you go, it has a little... I noticed some don't that, do that, some do. Yeah. I noticed a connection between the Ruya and the we children of hers, that they begin to float when they are charged up. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> they get the, the Ruya powers as well. <laughs> yeah, man. <laughs> and... There we go. Nailed it. I know Debra yep. asked you a question about the the sort of some words of wisdom, right? I'm sure. gonna ask you the same question, but I'm gonna tailor it more to sort of uh, the audience of upcoming designers. So sort of the people who might be still be studying like me. Uh, sure. Anything that you know from the experience yourself from that learning process at university that people should do or not do, focus on, not focus on, you know? Um, I think, okay, uh, I guess it's different for everyone and giving advice is weird because if you listen to my advice and it doesn't work, then that's sort of bad advice. <laughs> but um, what's worked for me is failing often and fa like, you know, like failing as much as possible. And by mm -hmm. failing, I mean like, just like making loads of stuff and learning a bunch and growing and like studying loads of theory uh, that goes like a really long way. Um, it sounds kind of cliche as well, but like, I think, um, just being honest, like goes a long way and being kind of authentic and true to who you are mm -hmm. kind of goes a long way. And one thing I find as well, like, especially kind of people thinking, or like people who are like just graduating that are perhaps wanting to pursue video games. I think a lot of people perhaps like the idea of being a video game developer rather than making games, if that makes sense. So they like the idea of it more than they do actually making games. Yeah. And I think that's I think that's a really important thing to <clears throat> like observe in yourself. Like you should ask yourself if you love making games rather than like telling people that you love games because a lot of people pursue things kind of like for their own ego just to just because it sounds cool or so it sounds romantic and I think that if if it's something that doesn't make your soul sing then it's it's kind of like a waste of your time and you, you should pursue the thing that you know that makes you really happy and that you really resonate with yeah mm -hmm. I see very some very wise words for, for of advice <laughs> thank you very much um, cool man <laughs> in terms of uh, social media of yours, uh, I know people can find you on Twitter, at least your studio at Miracle 
T underscore, yeah. I believe. Yeah, that's, and yeah, that's right, man. Do you want to shout out your Twitter as well? Uh, so my personal Twitter is Bradley Smith 93 And if you have any questions or, like, design stuff or anything that you need to ask about, like, transfuser and, like, you want to pick my brains, just, like, feel free to uh, message me there. Yeah. So, I highly cool. recommend that because having that knowledge is uh, extremely helpful when... Uh, especially when being an upcoming designer, having all of this knowledge is like, you know what to do, what not to do, just through experience of someone else, you know? Uh, sure, yeah, incredible. a lot of it comes with time, I think, you know? Mm. Absolutely. Cool. Okay, it is Cheers, three, uh, right on time to finish up. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for watching, and thank you very much for chatting to me today. Cool. Take care. Cheers, man. Bye-bye.